The Equitable Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. To your FBI, you look for national security, and to the Equitable Society for financial security. These two great institutions are dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Tonight's file, The Big Breakout. criminals suffer from the same organic disorder, enlargement of the ego, and sooner or later it proves fatal to their career of crime. For as an ancient thinker once said, he is most vulnerable who believes himself invincible. For some criminals, one heavy prison sentence is enough to deflate their ego, but in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, Earl Dixon accepted his first set of prison bars not as a defeat, but as a great opportunity to prove himself smarter than the law. In a Midwestern penitentiary, Dixon, serving a term for hijacking, and two fellow inmates are seated in their cell after the evening meal. Cigarette, gentlemen? Rock? Oh, thanks, Dixie. Louis? Yeah, if that's the best you can do, Dixie... Of course, I'm used to lighting a corona after a pheasant You're dinner, used to but... talking too much, Louie. <laughs> Somebody's got to keep the art of chatter alive in our little home. Rock is a man of action rather than words, Louie. Well, you ain't exactly the gabby type yourself, Dixie. I've been interested in only one subject since matriculating here. <laughs> but you uh, ain't talking about it, huh? I never talk on a subject until I'm qualified by research. Mm. When'll that be? No. Oh, Yeah. Then what's the title of your subject? Escape. Escape? Shut up, Louis. Are you gentlemen interested? Gee, Dixie, I don't know. I only got three more years here. Just the weekend, huh, Louis? No, no, it's not that, but guys can get shot trying something like that. I wonder what your girl is doing tonight, Louis. Yeah, what do you mean? Just curious. I know what she better not be doing. What's that got to do with it? Three years is a long time to sit and wonder. Maybe it'll be too late after that. Uh, what about you, Rob? Count me in, Dixie. Good. We'll make it a twosome. Wait, no, wait a minute. Yes, Louis. What did you really mean about my Dane? I told you. Three years is a long time. Oh, she better not pull no double deal on me. <laughs> I'm in. Splendid. What's the gimmick, Dixie? Well, the doctor is on duty in the hospital until 11 o'clock. Yeah. He lives outside, drives home, and his relief comes. Yeah. Lights out in here at 9. The turnkey makes a round of inspection at 10. Uh-huh. Tonight, when he comes around, you... Hospital ward, Dr. Wilson... Oh, hello, Evelyn. Yes, honey, I'll be on my way home in about ten minutes. As soon as Dr. Blaney comes in to relieve me. Huh? Oh, sure, sure, I'll bring some. Okay. Bye, sugar. Uh, What are you doing in here? People watch that door, Louie. Okay. Doctor's about your size, Rock. Jacket should fit you rather neatly. Just so it helps me drive us through the gate, okay. Here you are. And do it quickly now. Yeah. I'll take a look outside. 
Everything's all right, boys. Come on, quietly, please. Right. This is his car. Take the wheel, Rob. The way and I'll crouch on the floor right behind you. Okay. All right. Make for the gate. Keep your head down. Uh, don't worry. I want to keep it. But he's still alive. Do as I say. Okay. Sorry, Rock. <clears throat> Gee, I hated to do that. Consider yourself fortunate. It could easily have been you. What do you mean? I had anticipated that whoever drove the car would get killed. <laughs> After the jailbreak had been accomplished and the convicts had made a successful getaway, the penitentiary warden immediately contacted the nearest office of the FBI just across the state line, where Special Agent Connor took the call. Gray Pontiac, two-door sedan. License number? Seven, five, four, six. All right, I've got it. Which direction was it going when it left the penitentiary? Thanks, warden. We'll get on it right away. Jailbreak, Fred? Yes, three made the break. For one got killed. Who are the other two? Take the names. Uh-huh. Earl Dixon and Louis Muncie. Louis Muncie. I've got him. While I'm getting out an alarm, you contact Washington and ask them to teletype all information they have on Dixon and Muncie. In Dayton, Ohio, a few hours after the prison break... Two men walked quietly along a fog-shrouded street. They stopped in front of a modest apartment building. A minute later, a young girl occupying a ground-floor apartment was aroused by the insistent sound of the door buzzer. Just a minute. Oh. I'm coming. Who is it? Open the door. <gasps> Earl. Hello, sis. Earl, I... Go in, Louis. Okay. What are you... Be quiet. Lower that window shade, please, Louis. All right. Harold, what are you doing here? Okay, Louis. Yeah, all right. What are you doing here? How did you get out of prison? Quite cleverly. I escaped. Oh. It was a very monotonous life. I needed to change. Well, you don't seem very happy to see me. I'm not. Now, I ask you, Louis, is that, isn't that a shocking admission for one's own sister? Yeah. Oh, by the way, Annette, allow me to present my fellow Houdini, Louis Muncy. Pleased to know you. Why did you come here? Seemed the natural thing to do. Earl, you can't stay. Now, Annette. I mean it. You've got to leave here at once. Hey, what is this? I thought she was okay. She will be. Earl, listen to me. In the past, I've always weakened and tried to help you. Always thinking maybe you'd straighten out. But this time, it's different. I'm not harboring any criminal. I'm staying, Annette. Oh, no, you're not. Where are you going? I'm calling the police. Hey, now, wait a minute. Hold it, Louis. What are you going to tell them, Annette? That you're turning your brother in? That you want him sent back to prison? Yes. Then I'd better acquaint you with just what that would mean. A man was killed when we escaped. Oh. Now, my dear, could you make us some coffee? Is that teletype from Washington, Fred? Yes, with the dope on Dixon and Muncie. What does it say? It looks like Dixon was the brains behind the break. Yes? College education and always boasting how much smarter he is than the law. What was he in for? Hijacking. Uh -huh. He was sentenced in federal court. Suspected of a killing, too, but there wasn't enough evidence to pin it on him. What about Muncie? They're just finishing up on him now. 
Here. Here we are. Well, Muncie seems to be a kind of a stooge in a gang that was mixed up in hijacking, too. He'd probably stick with Dixon, then, for guidance. I wouldn't be surprised. Any reports on the fugitives while I was out? No. Mm, they could be clear out of the state by this time. Yes, that makes them our game more than ever. Any leads on Dixon and that stuff from Washington? I was just looking it over. It says Dixon lived with his sister in Cincinnati just before he was sent up. You know, he might make for there again. Mm, wouldn't that be an obvious move? Well, since Dixon considers himself smarter than the law, he might think the obvious thing to do would be least expected. Let's get Cincinnati on the phone. We'll tell him not to wait until daylight to check up, but go out right now and keep a watch on her address. Right. Remember this piece in Ed? How I used to slave to learn it. As I recall, it was Mother's favorite... Stop, Bill, please. What's the matter? The difference between then and now, I... I don't want to think of it. Dear Annette, always the sentimentalist. Earl. Yes? How long is this going to go on? What? This staying here. Oh. Oddly enough, I was just thinking about that. Police are bound to come here sometime. You saw the morning paper. They're combing three states looking for you. I know. Oh, please, won't you give yourself up? Oh, stop being childish. What else can you do? I have a very definite plan in mind. You're right about their eventually coming here, but when they arrive, we'll be gone. What do you mean? We still have that little houseboat on the Ohio River. Yes. Then I think we should use it. We? Yes. You and I. Oh, no, please. I'll aid you in that. You'll have to drive. Oh, why can't you leave me alone? It's very pleasant, like a vacation. Vacation with two murderers. Oh, I forgot to mention my good companion, Mr. Muncy, who sleeps so peacefully in your bedroom, will not be with us. Do you intend to leave him here? Not exactly. I don't understand. Well, he has already served his purpose. Where you are see, you, it... folks? Oh. Yeah. Greetings, Louis. Well, I was just talking about you. Oh, yeah? Yes, I was telling my sister that we are going to take a little trip. Oh, blowing out of here? Yes. Where are we going? Well, unfortunately, Louis, you're not really coming along. What do you mean? I needed you for the getaway just as I needed Rock, but now your usefulness has ended. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry, Louis. Oh. 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 Darling. He'll be with us in spirit. We momentarily close the Equitable Society's presentation of the FBI file on the big breakout. We will return to this case in just a moment. Let's look at America through the eyes of a G.I. just back from the Pacific. He's flying cross-continent to his home in the east. And perhaps he's wondering what sort of job he'll land when he takes off his uniform. Well, no matter what route his army transport plane follows, at some time in almost every hour of the flight, he's looking down on places where equitable society investments are helping to provide jobs for ex-servicemen. Whether his plane soars over the cattle-studded plains of Texas or the waving wheatlands of Minnesota, over the cornfields of Iowa or the tobacco plantations of Kentucky, equitable society dollars are right there, soundly invested with progressive American farmers to promote farm prosperity. Or take practically any industrial center in which his plane might land. Take Chicago or Detroit, Cleveland or Pittsburgh. These also are centers for the investment of equitable society funds in steel mills and mines, in railroads and shipyards, in textile mills and industrial plants of all kinds. Yes, with equitable society dollars at work in every section of the country, and with the Equitable Society's three and a quarter million members living in every state in the Union, 
This great mutual organization is well named the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. For since 1859, Equitable Society dollars have helped make the whole United States the land of opportunity. Yes, by serving its members for 86 years, the Equitable Society has served America. And now back to the file on the big breakout. FBI agents make no pretense of infallibility. And although highly trained in their profession of criminal investigation, things happen so fast at times that human judgment is bound to err in one step or another in their investigative procedure. But this they have never failed to do. Readjust. The long hours of the day have dragged past. And now darkness is falling. Earl Dixon sits with his sister in the living room of her apartment. Who's that? How do I know? See who it is. I'll stand just behind the door. And don't let anyone in. Understand? Very well. Good evening. Good evening. You're Miss Annette Dixon, are you not? Yes. I'm Special Agent Connor of the FBI. The FBI? Yes. We just learned that you had moved here from Cincinnati. But, but why are you interested in where I live? The automobile in which your brother escaped from prison last night was found early today, abandoned just outside of town. May I come in? But, but my brother isn't here. Then there's no reason why I shouldn't come in, is there? No, that is, Thank I... Thank you. I have a gun what? here, Mr. Connor. Uh, I've often wanted to match wits with the FBI. Don't reach for yours. I wouldn't have any wits left for you to match if I did. I was sure they trained you to be practical. Yes. That's one of the reasons we usually win, Dixon. Have you always won until now? I wouldn't say that now is exactly over. You fellows travel in pairs. Is your partner outside in the car? No. I came here alone. Where is your partner? I'm afraid you'll have to proceed without that knowledge. He and your office must have known you came here. You think so? Yes. In that event, I think you'd better come along with us. Where to? My sister and I are taking a little trip. You'd be a very welcome companion. Really? Yes. With an FBI agent driving us in an FBI car, we should find it rather a safe journey. At your service, Mr. Dixon. Thank you. Oh, by the way... You wouldn't mind transporting a corpse, too, would you? It would be rather awkward leaving him here. Louis Muncy? That's right. Bring him along. I'd be very glad to have his body as evidence of murder against you. What makes you think you'll be able to produce this evidence? This was to be a match of wits, remember? <laughs> When Special Agent Connor did not return to Dayton Police Headquarters within the designated time to rejoin his partner, Special Agent Whitman, Whitman and a police officer drove to Miss Dixon's address. Whitman is now returning to the car. There's something funny about this, Sergeant. I saw you go inside after you got no answer. I found this on the floor in the living room. What is it? Connor's wallet. What? And dresser drawers had been pulled open like somebody had packed and left in a hurry. Well. I'd say Connor ran into Dixon, all right. And possibly Muncie, too. And he dropped his wallet to let you know he'd been here and something was wrong. Yes. With his car gone, that means only one thing. Let's put out an alarm on that car. This is such a pleasure. The rolling fields, the green trees. You know, I've looked at penitentiary walls so long I'd forgotten this even existed. Isn't it lovely, Annette? Please don't talk to me. <laughs> My sister doesn't approve of me, Mr. Connor. I'd say she has excellent taste. Oh, poor Louis. 
Poor Louis would have enjoyed this so. Which reminds me, I've decided not to dispose of his body anywhere along the way. Really? The river will be a much better place. Bodies have a disconcerting way of rising to the surface. Not when they're properly weighted, Mr. Connor. Oh. And that should offer a cue to your own fate. Thank you. Too bad you won't be able to enjoy a weekend on our little houseboat. You'd like to have his company, wouldn't you, Annette? Please, Earl. Uh oh. What's the matter? Car trouble. Accidental, of course. What other kind is there? That sounds like a flooded carburetor. What have you done to it? The car stalled. Would you like to get out and diagnose the trouble yourself? You'd like that, wouldn't you? You go ahead and fix it, and I'm warning you. If you take too long... I won't, I assure you. Why don't we get some word, Sergeant? Well, we've done everything we can, Mr. Whitman. Something should come in. And that's the toughest thing about this business. They're waiting. I know. They must have taken Connor along as cover. If they did, Connor's driving the car. We put all that on the alarm. Is there any more background on the Dixon family? Any place he'd be likely to go to? Mm, I'm having that checked now. In the meantime, the clock is running out. We're running out fast. I'll get it. Police headquarters, Sergeant Gillen speaking. Yes? Yes? Where was this? Just a minute, Mr. Whitman. Yes. This is state police. They got something on Connor. Uh, let me talk to them, please. Sure, here you are. Hello? This is Special, Special Agent Whitman speaking. What have you got? I see. Uh, will you read it, please? Yes? Thank you very much. Goodbye. Come on, Sergeant. We've got a definite lead on Connor. I just hope we're not too late. Where did my sister go, Connor? Into the houseboat. Oh. Well, I guess you've got Muncie's body weighted sufficiently now. Enough to keep it from drifting. That'll make it easier for us to locate. Us? Mm-hmm. I admire your optimism. Now, if you will just drag the body out onto the deck. There, that will do nicely. And now I'll ask you to hoist it over the side. You're really running up a big score, Dixon. Just remember this gun. Go ahead, Connor. Okay. And now I suggest that we return to the cabin. Go ahead. After you, Mr. Connor. Thanks. Annette. Annette, will you stop that crying? Leave her alone. Well... Sir Galahad. Will you have a drink? No, thanks. Then I guess we'd better pass on to the next item on the program. That turns out to be you, Mr. Connor. Earl, Earl, you can't... Hold it, miss. Dixon. Yes? You said this was to be a match of wits. That's right. And it's been rather unbalanced in my favor, wouldn't you say? No, I wouldn't. What do you mean? You had that pistol on me all evening. But it didn't keep me from working. Working? You didn't see me drop my wallet on the floor of your sister's apartment back in Dayton, did you? Now, don't pull I that. I saw it. What? Annette, why didn't you... I left it there because I knew my partner would find it very shortly and know something was wrong. Look, Connor... I'm just trying to get my wits on the record. Very well. And you were right in suspecting I caused the car trouble back on the highway. All you gained was time, if you did. No. I left a note under a tool when I was under the car... Must have been picked up by now. And what did the note say? That we were coming here. Well, that makes you almost even. I'd say that puts me a little bit ahead. Annette, I think we're getting out of here. I hate to keep piling up points, Dixon, but the keys to the car are in the river with Muncie's body. Why, you... Now, don't be a bad loser, Dixon. I haven't lost. Oh, no? Look at that car coming along the riverbank. Where? Where? Thank heaven. Is it the police? It isn't even a car. That was an old trick, Miss Dixon. But I won the match. Earl 
Earl Dixon was returned to the penitentiary and subsequently tried and convicted for the murder of his fellow convict. Like all criminals, Dixon had an inflated estimation of his own ability to beat the law. And this was one of the most effective contributing factors to his inevitable downfall. No one is smarter than the law. Sooner or later, this inescapable fact is known to all criminals. You'll hear about next week's case in just a moment. This week, at the Equitable Society, I was shown three checks that were ready to go out in the afternoon mail. One was the biggest check I've ever seen in my life. A six, followed by six zeros. A six million dollar investment of Equitable Society funds in a great industrial concern which will employ several thousand men, many of them returning servicemen. The second check was for $16,000, a loan to a farmer in Iowa who came to his Equitable Society so that he could buy a piece of land he's had his eye on for many years. The third check was for $6,000, and it was going to help an ex-sergeant of the Marines buy that little house he dreamed about while he lay in a hospital recovering from wounds received on Guadalcanal. Now he's going to own that little home with the aid of the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. And there you have three of the principal ways in which Equitable Society dollars are put to work. In promoting home ownership. In lending farmers a helping hand. In keeping the wheels of industry turning. And that's why we think this life insurance business we're in is a good business. We collect premium dollars from our members for their good and then invest them in ways that are good for the entire nation. Yes, this week and every week for 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. Next Friday, December 7th, is the fourth anniversary of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Our program that evening will present a thrilling and factual account of the FBI's work on that momentous day. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for this is your FBI. This is ABC the American Broadcasting Company.